This morning, we welcome to our pulpit, pulpit the Reverend Dr. Erwin Ince, who serves as a pastor at Grace DC Presbyterian Church and the director of Grace DC Institute of Cross Cultural Mission. Reverend Ince is a graduate of City College of New York, Reformed Theological Seminary, and Covenant Theological Seminary, where he received his Doctorate of Ministry degree in 2016. He, he and his wife, Kim, have been married for 27 years and have four children. Yesterday, he led some of our staff in session in a four-hour workshop, which explored issues of race, culture, and biblical reconciliation. We are delighted to have him back this morning to preach God's word, God's word to us through video. So thanks for being God's voice to us today, Dr. Erwin Ince. A joy to have been with you all uh, this weekend, even though it's been virtual uh, and we would have much preferred uh, to be there uh, with you physically, face to face. Such as it is, these are our times. And this morning I do have the privilege of bringing God's word before you. And I want to speak to you from uh, the book of Revelation chapter 21 and verses 1 through 5. On this subject, the beautiful community, Destiny's Children. The beautiful community, Destiny's Children. Look with me at... God's word in Revelation 21. This is John speaking, and he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man, he will dwell with them and they will be uh, his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He'll he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down. For these words are trustworthy and true. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Our Lord and our God, we are grateful this morning for your word, this word that is alive and that is active and that is sharper than any double-edged sword that pierces to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. And we all, Lord God, are today in this space and this time naked and exposed to you, the one to whom we must all give account. And that's good news, Lord, because that means you know precisely then what we stand in need of. And so would you be pleased to take these efforts of mine, weak and unworthy that they may be, and use them to meet us where we are and give us what we need, faith hope, encouragement, correction, conviction, peace, joy, that we might be people who live for the glory, honor, and fame of Jesus Christ. And we ask it in his name. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, one of the things that has really been kind of thrown out of whack and off course uh, during this uh, COVID pandemic season has been weddings. Uh, both my wife and I are from Brooklyn, New York, and uh, we were born and raised there. We got married there. And so we were uh, excitedly anticipating uh, the wedding of our son and uh, his fiance this summer, which was to take place there in, uh, in New York City. And COVID hit and, uh, and it threw things off course and what had planned to be a person in-person wedding uh, in New York turned out to be a virtual wedding over Zoom uh, where the bride and groom were actually in Chicago. So it happened and we were grateful for it. Um, and for this reality, the, the one true thing that 
uh, that my son and his uh, and his new bride are learning through this pandemic season is this enduring truth that the beauty of their marriage is not uh, the wedding day or the perfection of the day, but the union that is formed by that wedding. If you've never been married, a weddings can be engender in you a sense of longing as you anticipate the day uh, that you may be married. If you were once married and are no longer married for reasons of either death or divorce, while you might be happy for a newlywed couple, weddings uh, can be a challenge. They can remind you of your own sense of loss and the accompanying pain or disappointment of that loss. There can be a longing for relief from that disappointment or pain. And so whether your experience at weddings is delightful or difficult, whether your marriage experience is mostly picturesque or or painful, it should amaze us that when God wants to give us a picture of what heaven is like, the imagery that he uses is of a wedding. Do you want to know the destiny of those who come to God through faith in Jesus Christ? Picture in your mind the best wedding and marriage you can imagine and then uh, multiply it by infinity. When God wants to declare to his people what their destiny is, what he does is give us the picture of a beautiful bride decked out for her husband in anticipation of eternal life together with him. Understand that the Bible actually begins and ends with a wedding. In the first two chapters, the pinnacle of creation uh, uh, is the man and the woman. And we hear these words from Genesis chapter 2 and verse 24 at weddings, all the time, for this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and, and cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. But those words were not just for repetitions at wedding ceremonies. They also set a trajectory forward in anticipation of the words that we hear in Revelation 21, when John says, I saw the holy city the new Jerusalem as she descended out of heaven from God after being prepared and adorned as a bride for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven cry, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with humanity and he will be with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. What does it mean to have this kind of destiny? What does it mean to be destiny's children? It means a guarantee of beauty, a guarantee of personal beauty, a guarantee of collective corporate beauty where nothing that is not beautiful will ever exist again. It sounds like a fantasy, yes, when we look at our world, but it is backed by the full faith and credit of God himself. And so I want to hone in on two things as we work through this passage today. I want to talk about longing for beauty and living for beauty. Destiny's children live with a longing for all things to be the way they ought to be. They live with a longing for all things to be made beautiful. That is the longing for things to be right and, and good and true and righteous. And yet they have to become comfortable with the fact that, this, that, that as long as they live in this world, they will not escape the reality of longing for something more and for something better. Things are not the way they ought to be. The wedding is scheduled, but they don't know the date. Secondly, Destiny's children live together in the reality that 
the future promise of beauty has actually broken in on the present world and life today. And as they are being prepared for life as it ought to be, they actually can have an experience of a life of beauty today. Therefore, life now is not a hopeless venture. They have eyes to see the renewal and the renovation and the transformation that's coming. Longing for beauty. John says in verse 1, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the former heaven and the former earth. They passed away. Here toward the end of this last book of the Bible, we, what we are seeing with greater clarity is how God intends to satisfy the longings of his people. One of the questions that God's people ask him in the Bible repeatedly is how long? <laughs> David asks in the 13th Psalm, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? In Revelation chapter 6 and verse 10, the martyrs, they, they cry out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. How long can you wait for things to be the way they ought to be? You know what words repeat themselves over and over again in this book of Revelation? John keeps saying, I saw this, I saw that, I heard this, and I heard that. The covers are pulled back for him so that with his own eyes he sees and with his ears he hears the true reality. It's not that what we see with our eyes and what we hear with our ears and what we experience with our senses uh, are, are untrue. It's, that, it's just that what our senses provide us is not the full picture. There's more to it. The Lord gives John uh, and the church insight to what is going on beyond or behind what we see and what we are able to perceive. The curtains are pulled back and John sees a new heavens and a new earth. The, the former heaven and earth had passed away. The sea was no more. John is letting us know this is where the world is headed. This is the world's destiny. Not only that, but I... I saw the, the holy city, the, the new Jerusalem. I saw that too. I saw that city as she descended out of heaven from God, as she was prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I didn't only see the destiny of the world. I saw the destiny, the beautiful destiny of God's people as well. And John was not the first to see it or the first to say it, the Lord had declared it through Isaiah centuries before John was alive. The people of Israel were in exile, longing to be restored to their land. And the Lord gives Isaiah a message in chapter 62 and verses 3 to 5 of his book. He, the Lord says to his people, you shall be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no longer be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her, and your land married, for the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married, for as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you, and as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. In Isaiah's day, the people's vision 
It was too short-sighted. They just wanted to get back to that patch of land in Palestine. And the Lord had to say to them, your vision is too small. It's too short-sighted. I'm not just concerned with some plot of land uh, in in Palestine. I'm remaking this whole deal. And hundreds of years later, after Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, after he comes to save his people, giving up his life on the cross for their sake, being buried in the tomb and rising on the third day and ascending to the right hand of the throne of the majesty on high in his victory over death. After that, his people, after all of that, his people are still asking, how long, O Lord? When is our resurrection? His people are still waiting. The one who sits on the throne has to reiterate, Behold, I am making all things new. Write it down, John, because these words are faithful and they are true. It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You see, we ache and we groan, and we long for things to be better than they are. The compromising and the idolatrous nature of humanity is that we try to fix things. We try to fix our longings for beauty ourselves. I try to I try to hold out hope for that beautiful, aesthetically pleasing, athletic body. <laughs> I, uh, I I batter my body doing stuff like CrossFit and, and trying to eat healthy most of the time. And I tell people, why am I doing that? I tell people, listen, I'm just trying to delay the decay. Like decay is coming. I know that the decay is inevitable, but I'm just trying to slow it down a bit to, to stave it off. The human mind has been able to discover and develop great medical advancements. We put our minds to use through technology, attempting to make life better and to heal what's broken, whether that's bones or relationships. Like, I'm glad that medical research is hard at work even now trying to create a a COVID-19 vaccine. I'm glad that the creative genius of humanity tries to strive for something better by making beautiful music and and beautiful art. However, in all of our striving, in all of our efforts, in all of our longings, we cannot make things so beautiful, so radically new, such that there will be no more decay. Death, death is not the great enemy that is defeated by modern medical technology. Death is the great enemy that is defeated by the cross of Jesus Christ. John is declaring to us that only God can do this. He's the source of beauty. So only he, as the preacher says in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, only he can make all things beautiful in its time. Only God, only God can make all things new. Listen, this newness and this beauty is not the outcome of human scientific knowledge or technological advancement. As one commentator on this passage in Revelation put it, the new city comes down out of heaven from God, a sheer miracle, a gift, a gift that is bestowed at the end of human history, not as the outcome of it. Do you hear this newness, this beauty comes to us as a gift bestowed Uh, at the end of human history from God, not as the outcome of our advancements. In other words, the beauty of the bride, the beauty of the new creation is not the outcome of human progress. It is a gift from God. That word in our text, behold, it is not a call first and foremost to do something. It is a call 
to observe, observe and to see, to look and to see, behold, I am making all things new. Watch and see. It is an invitation to look and to believe and to rejoice. God is committed to the beautiful renovation of his creation. The word new in our text, that it, uh, it, it is typically used to, to indicate newness in terms of quality. In other words, through the victory of Jesus Christ over death, God is executing his renovation project. And this longing we have for our beautification and for the beautification of the world, it can weigh us down. That is because try and try as we might, we cannot successfully cover the eyes, cover our eyes at all of the ugliness. We can't cover the eyes at all of the ugliness that we see in this world. The beauty that we are longing for, the beauty that we are longing for is not the airbrushed sheen of the fashion magazine that's trying to hide the imperfections. Uh, Fleming Rutledge has a recent book titled Advent, The Once and Future Coming of Jesus Christ. And she puts it well in her section on looking into the heart of darkness. She writes this, she says, to grasp the depth of the human predicament, one has to be willing to enter into the very worst. Entering into the very worst means giving serious consideration to the most hopeless of situations. For instance, a facility for the most profound cases of developmental disability. What hope is there for a ward full of people who will never sit up, walk, speak, or feed themselves. Tourists go to the site of Auschwitz-Birkenau and take pictures, but who can really imagine the smells and the sounds of the most depraved of all situations? The tourist, she says, can turn away in relief and go to lunch. Can I tell you something today? Can I tell you something? Those who belong to Jesus Christ, to Jesus Christ, are not tourists who turn away and go to lunch. We're not tourists who turn away from the ugliness and go to lunch. We're people who live for beauty even as we long for beauty. However, when in this life we get glimpses into reflections of eternal beauty, the paradox of it, the seeming contradiction of the presence of eternal beauty alongside the ugliness and the deep depravity of life can be a burden that is too heavy to bear. In a recent talk on the paradox of beauty, Artist Makoto Fujimura described his becoming a Christian in this way. He was in Japan, he said, studying an old form of Japanese paintings called Nihonga. And he said that, uh, that the way that Jesus led him to faith was by confronting him with beauty. It was through the extravagant crushed materials he was using in his artwork, Malachite and Azurite, gold, and silver, and other precious materials, beautiful, extravagant materials that he was learning to use and he was mastering. And he said, every day I sought higher transcendence through the extravagant materials. I found success in expression through Nihonga materials. And yet, he says, the weight of beauty I saw in the materials began to crush my own heart. I could not justify the use of extravagant materials if I found my heart unable to contain their glory. The presence of beauty now is hard to bear because its glory can be too much. Would you look with me at just a few verses beyond our passage at the weight of glory 
that is described not just of God, but of the glory of the bride. In Revelation chapter 21, verses 9 through 11, John says, Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride the wife of the lamb. And John says, he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. It's radiance like a most rare jewel, like a jasper clear as crystal. The point of John seeing for us and describing for us this eternal beauty isn't simply to make us long for the sweet by and by of heaven that's to come. It is to, to even more enable us to live for beauty now as we long for it, even among the, the ugliness of life in this world. It's for us to feel the weight of that beauty and that glory and not be crushed by it. As we refuse to turn our eyes away from the very worst of the human predicament. You see, Destiny's children hold on. Destiny's children take their cues for living from what has been revealed by God. The churches to whom John was writing this book of Revelation, they were in a fight. They were suffering persecution. They were facing poverty. They were facing political oppression. They were facing the temptation to compromise their faith so that life would be better and easier for them in the here and now. And they needed to know that God's promise that their destiny was to be with him as he remade everything was more certain than what their eyes were seeing and what their ears were hearing and what they were experiencing in the present. And this is the very same thing that we need to know. We need to know that God's promise to be with us as he remakes everything is more certain than anything we experience in life today. The people who have this destiny can live for beauty even as they long for beauty. What does this living for beauty look like? It looks like pursuing the beauty of the bride. You see, the bride is not a single person. The bride is humanity all together in the perfection of unity and diversity under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Fractures and divides and hostilities and contempt between peoples have been healed. John goes on to describe the city in chapter 22. He sees the river of the water of life. He says, bright as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. Also, he says, on either side of the river, the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be anything that is accursed but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. Living for beauty now means pressing. It means pressing into the healing of the nations through faith in Jesus Christ, the healing of our divides, of our fractures, of our, of our contempt, and our striving together in beautiful community. Can I tell you something, Knox Presbyterian? Folks should not be able to look at your church and say, well, that's a church that's mainly for white people. That's a church that's mainly for Asian people. That's a church that's mainly for black or Latino per people. That's a, that's a church that's that's mainly for people who lean blue politically or people who lean red politically. It should be hard. It should be hard for people to look at your church and figure it out or, or label it based on the, the categories we like to use in society and culture that makes people 
our kind of people or people we need to stay away from. No, people, the world, should be able to look at your church and get a glimpse, get a picture of where, of where God is taking humanity. To get a picture of where God is taking humanity and the world living for beautiful community means living into a love for neighbors that actively seeks to bring fellowship, bring into fellowship people who might have nothing in common except the fact that God gave himself for up for them in the person of Jesus Christ. And this has practical implications for our lives. It means that we will find ways to faithfully bring God's word to bear in our diverse communities such that it has an impact on the whole person or the circumstances of the whole person. It means that we won't truncate the gospel message as if it only addresses personal sin and brokenness. We will address the systems and the structures in the public square and in the church that deny our fellow image bearers, that deny our neighbors their inherent dignity as image bearers of God. It means that we'll be willing to ask probative questions of our church? What's the history of our church? What drives the content of our liturgy on Sunday? What ways are we simply catering to the majority culture and possibly hindering non-majority culture neighbors from experiencing a rich sense of belonging and welcoming among us? And what what, what preferences are we willing to die to for the sake of loving our diverse neighbors better? See, this is hard. This is hard. In fact, it is impossible apart from the Spirit of God at work among us, working in us and through us. So let me end with this encouragement to you. Understand that because of who God is, he can declare in verse 6, it is done. The Greek text literally says they are done. It's not a singular, it is done. It is everything that I said was going to take place, everything that I promised, they are already done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the God of the beginning of history, the God of the end of history, and the God of everything in between. Therefore, listen, nothing is wasted our effort to live for beauty is hard, but none of it goes to waste. The loud voice from heaven says to John that God will wipe away every tear, that there will be no more death, that there will be no more mourning, there'll be no more crying, there, there'll, there, there'll be no more pain. Those things have, have passed away. But please know that today's tears, today's mournings, today's crying, today's pains, they are not wasted. They're not wanted, but they're not wasted either. Notice with me, please, that what John sees in verse number two is the holy city descending out of heaven from God after it was prepared and adorned as a bride for her husband. These are passive verbs. The Emphasis is, is, is that it is God who prepared the bride. It is God who adorned the bride. He's the one who selected the wedding dress. He's the, the makeup artist and the hairstylist. And yes, he even drove the limo because it says that she came down out of heaven from God as a bride prepared for her husband. How did he prepare the bride? How did he prepare her for the wedding day? It was through the tears. It was through the mourning. It was through the crying. It was through the pain. He equipped her to endure by faith as a part of her beautification. You see, this enables us to keep our eyes open and to live for beauty right now, following Jesus' lead. We live for beauty just as our Savior did the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who exists 
in eternal beauty and glory refused to turn his eyes away from the darkness of our world. So the son left the beautiful communion that he had with the Father and the Spirit to take on our fragility and our weaknesses and our vulnerability so that he could restore us to beautiful communion with himself and with one another. Secure in our own beauty, we see the darkness of this world and we keep looking for and pointing out how this world, even though things are often tragic and toxic, we continue to live for and point out how this world is still charged with the grandeur and glory of God. And we keep working for beauty in his name. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the one who is beauty personified and that you bring us into the life of beautiful communion and community with you and with one another. Would you strengthen us and enable us to live and long for beauty even today as a witness to the world that you are indeed who you say you are, to the glory of your name and the good of our neighbors. Amen, amen, and amen.